Welcome, Van Runner. I have to confess that when I ran my most recent poll to decide what computer I would cover next in my Amazing Facts series, I never expected the Amiga 500 to win. Now that might seem surprising to some people given what a hugely popular computer it was back in the day, and indeed still is, with a very passionate modern fanbase too. But you have to understand that the common theme of these polls has been votes for the underdog. So far we have seen hugely popular computers and consoles like the Sinclair ZX Spectrum, Super Nintendo and Commodore 64 ignored in favour of obscure oddities like the FM Towns Marty, Panasonic Laser Active and Oric 1. Maybe we're seeing a change in what people want with the rising popularity of my channel. After all I looked at the equally mainstream Sega Dreamcast last time out. Or perhaps this was just a blip but the Amiga comfortably won your vote over the Fujitsu FM7, Mattel Aquarius, Amstrad PCW and Sharp X1, so here I am with the video you asked for. Taking that already stated popularity of the platform into account, I pondered greatly over how to approach this video, because YouTube is literally flooded with videos on the Amiga. In fact, many of the most vocal commenters on the poll in question stated they wanted to see anything but the Amiga for that very reason which also played on my mind. What I eventually came up with is a video that very much focuses on the facts of the A500 without going off on too many diversions elsewhere, and I still tried to include at least a few stories that aren't well known. I stayed away from obvious Amiga tropes like its video toaster that was used to create the effects in various movies and TV shows as they certainly weren't done on an A500 and it's been covered so many times before. And I haven't talked about its games or demos because they're well covered on other channels too. Because of all this it did feel a bit different to my other Amazing Facts videos, well for me anyway, but I'll be interested to read your comments in due course. Now let's get on with the show as I proudly present 10 Amazing Commodore Amiga A500 Facts. I am the Commodore Amiga 500 home computer, dazzling animation at your command. I am the Commodore Amiga 500, a multitasking home office in your hand. I am the Commodore Amiga 500, total home video you control, and arcade quality games in stereo. And now, you can be everything I am. Many other models available. See your full service authorized dealer, Modern Business Machines. this first entry we need to go back to 1984 to look at the state of play in the home computer market. Atari, Apple and Commodore were all still fighting it out with their respective 8-bit machines but also had new more advanced 16-bit micros on the horizon. Apple were just about to release the Mac, Commodore were developing the C900, I've done a whole video on this if you're interested in knowing more which I'll link in the description, and Atari were funding a group of their ex-employees led by the chief designer of the Atari 2600 and Atari 8-bit computer, J Minor, called Amiga, that were working on the highly advanced Lorraine project, which was being designed as both a home console and computer, much like the Atari 8-bit before it. However, trouble was brewing for both Atari and Commodore, as the latter had just ousted founder and CEO Jack Trammell over disagreements about the direction of the company and Atari's parent company Warner Brothers had chosen to put them up for sale due to the losses they had incurred as a result of the great North American video game crash. Meanwhile an angry Jack promptly formed a new company called Trammell Technology, spelt this way as it's actually the correct way to pronounce his surname, along with his sons and several ex-Commodore employees. Their objective was to create an affordable 16-bit computer to bring the next generation of micros to the largest audience possible. Jack was also very aware of the growing computer industry in Japan and was keen to stop them in their tracks. Soon after this though, Jack heard about Warner Brothers' intentions to offload their debt-ridden division and saw this as an opportunity to re-enter the market and get back at his former company. After much negotiation, he struck a favourable deal to purchase the Atari consumer division from Warner and accelerated the development of his new computer under the Fuji brand. And this is where it gets really interesting. Amid rumours that Trammel was negotiating to purchase Atari, Amiga Corporation entered discussions with their rivals Commodore. 
They didn't want to work with the often divisive Jack Trammell and saw his old company as a way out. This led to Commodore wanting to purchase Amiga Corporation outright, which Commodore believed would cancel any outstanding contracts including Atari's. Instead of Amiga Corp delivering Lorraine to Atari, Commodore provided a payment of $500,000 to Atari on Amiga's behalf. In effect, returning the funds that Atari had invested in Amiga for the Lorraine chipset. A litany of lawsuits soon followed from both Atari and Commodore, with each trying to block the other and various claims of industrial espionage. An agreement was eventually reached out of court between the two companies and Commodore completed their acquisition of Amiga. And although this meant that Commodore could bring Amiga's new computer to market, Jack managed to get his computer out the door first, finishing the development of it in just under six months, and beating his old company to the punch. But of course, this early advantage didn't count for much, as the more powerful Amiga hardware eventually won out, and left many wondering what could have been. One of the greatest legacies of the Amiga is actually the people behind it, and their unique impact on the home computer and console industry in general. The story behind the Amiga Amigos actually starts off at Rivals Atari, where the Grass Valley Research Group developed both the Atari 2600 video computer system and Atari 8-bit computer. This group was led by the genius that is Jay Miner and also included the likes of Joe DeCure and Larry Kaplan. But in 1979, after an argument over pay and royalties, Kaplan decided to leave Atari, along with a group of fellow engineers and programmers, and co-founded Activision. In 1982, Kaplan was approached by a number of investors who wanted to develop a new high-tech game system. Kaplan subsequently hired his former colleague Jay Miner to run the hardware side of the newly formed company. Initially christened High Toro, this new company would set about designing a new console that was codenamed Lorraine in keeping with Miner's policy of giving systems female names. The lady who provided the influence in this case was the wife of company president Dave Morse. Much to people's surprise, Kaplan chose to move on again and quit Hightower in 1982 to be replaced at the engineering helm by the man he had hired, Jay Miner. Shortly after this, the new company was renamed Amiga Corporation and we all know what happened next. But the part of the story we're focusing on here is of course the people. And of course, Miner and Morse were also joined by the likes of RJ Michael and Dave Needle. The relationships between all these people would prove important because many of them would stay together to develop more technologically advanced systems for other companies. After Miner fell into poor health, which would eventually result in his untimely death in June 1994, many of the people behind the Amiga, including Morse and Michael, most notably, would stick together and design the Epics Handy, which would eventually become the Atari Lynx, of course bringing them back full circle. And then they came up with the advanced 32-bit 3DO interactive multiplayer before they all moved on to pastures new. Is there a more influential team of engineers in the history of the video game industry than Jay Miner and his Amigos? I think not. As I've already mentioned in passing, the Amiga's big rival, the Atari ST, very much had the early advantage in the 16-bit computer war. Not only did it release first, but also had a huge cost advantage over the Amiga 2. To give some context, the Amiga 1000 launched at an eye-watering price of $1,295, which equates to nearly $3,500 in today's money, whilst the rival 520ST could be bought for just shy of $800 less than two thirds of the price. This early dominance was helped even more by the release of the 520 STF just a year later in 1986 that combined the ST design into one sleek unit with an internal power supply and floppy disk drive, hence the F. This basic design would then be enhanced further throughout the ST's life. Not only was the all-in-one design much cheaper to produce, but also much more attractive to home users especially those who had gaming in mind and didn't want to faff around with connecting up different devices and certainly didn't want an expensive monitor when they had a perfectly decent colour TV. Commodore knew they had to come up with something in response and despite being slow to the cause, they eventually released their own all-in-one unit, the A500, in 1987 for a considerably cheaper price of $699, nearly half the cost of the A1000 at launch. Not only did the new Amiga 500 look like an ST with its off-white casing, 
but also featured a remarkably similar hardware setup with its built-in disk drive, double joystick ports and 512k of expandable RAM. This new model was just the boost Commodore needed, and from here sales of the Amiga increased exponentially, being especially attractive to those consumers who had gaming in mind. For the first time, the Amiga and Atari ST could truly be compared side by side, and it soon became clear who was going to win out in this epic battle for 16-bit dominance. For the next entry in this video, we need to rewind a bit, because I don't think it would be right to talk about the Amiga 500 without talking about the models that came before it, which all started with the Amiga 1000, which first hit the market in July 1985 after first being shown at the Summer CES show in 1994, where it wowed audiences with its advanced graphical capabilities and state-of-the-art sampled sound. The A1000, which was originally known rather simply as the Amiga from Commodore, had a number of characteristics that distinguished it from later models. Firstly, it's the only model to feature the short-lived Amiga checkmark logo on its case. The majority of the case is elevated slightly to give a storage area for the keyboard when not in use, often called a keyboard garage, and the inside of the case is engraved with the signatures of the Amiga designers, similar to the rival Apple Macintosh, including J Minor and the paw print of his dog, Mitchie. The Amiga 1000 was manufactured in two variations, PAL and NTSC. The latter variant was the initial model manufactured and sold in North America, the later PAL model was manufactured in Germany and sold predominantly in Europe. The initial NTSC systems lack the EHB video mode which is present in all later Amiga models. Because Amiga OS was rather buggy at the time of the A1000's launch, the OS was not placed in ROM. Instead, the A1000 included a daughter board with 256 kilobytes of RAM, dubbed the Writable Control Store, or WCS, into which the Kickstart operating system is loaded from floppy disk. The WCS is write protected after loading, and the system resets do not require a reload of the OS. In Europe, the WCS was often referred to as WOM, or Write Once Memory, a play on the more conventional ROM, aka Read Only Memory. Then, in 1985, Thomas Rattigan was promoted to COO of Commodore, and then to CEO in February 1986. The first thing on his agenda was to design a plan of action that would greatly reduce and refine the number of computers Commodore had on the market, including the long-expected discontinuation of both the PET and VIC-20, as well as the expansion of the Amiga range that would include the new high-end Amiga 2000 business machine and home-focused A500. The A2000 was launched just a month before the Amiga 500 and wouldn't stay on the market for very long before being replaced by the A3000 and eventually the top of the range A4000. Along with the release of the visually stunning Shadow of the Beast, the biggest thing that swung sales in favour of Commodore and their Amiga 500 over the Atari ST was the great RAM shortage of 1988. Now this was a rather complex affair that produced a pretty simple and straightforward result that I will endeavour to explain in layman's terms for you all. Although many things contributed to this situation, there were two key factors that caused a huge price rise of this essential component. The first of these was a new law that was passed by the US government in 1988 to try and avoid cheap RAM from factories in Asia being dumped on the US market, with prices which greatly undercut local manufacturers. However, despite the much welcomed rise in duty to 100%, it was too little too late for most US RAM manufacturers, who had already gone out of business, leaving tech companies with no alternative but to import. Now this first incident didn't affect Atari at all, as they built all their computers in Asia and then distributed them all from these factories directly. As the new law only affected standalone RAM chips and not pre-built electronics, they were not liable for any extra duty when shipping STs to the US. Commodore did, however, still have US manufacturing, so this was a big problem for them. They solved this by restarting the manufacturing of RAM in their chip factories. The second big event was a huge fire at a RAM factory in Osaka, Japan, that was reportedly responsible for one third of all the RAM manufactured in the world. This is what caused prices to shoot through the roof and hit Atari hard, as this was their main supplier. This forced Atari to raise the price of the ST in the UK, 
by then their biggest market, by £100 from £299 to £399. At around the same time, Commodore had lowered the price of the Amiga by £100 from £499 to £399. This put the rival computers on a level playing field for the very first time, and gave Commodore a huge advantage given the Amiga was more powerful and thus much better value for money. As Commodore had already made the wise decision to manufacture their own RAM to help supplement the Asian supplies, they were not forced to raise their prices, leaving Atari licking their wounds. At the end of 1991, Commodore announced that they were launching a new revised model of their best-selling Amiga called the A500 Plus. This new model looked cosmetically the same, but featured some minor changes to the motherboard to make it cheaper to produce the original A500. It was also notable for introducing new versions of Kickstart and Workbench, and for some minor improvements to the custom chips. However, it was soon discovered that the new Kickstart 2.1 04 ROM caused a number of rather unfortunate compatibility issues. This meant that many games including hugely popular titles like Treasure Island Dizzy, Swift and Lotus Esprit Turbo Challenge wouldn't run on the new machine. This saw many new customers returning their A500 Plus thinking it was faulty, and these retailers were soon demanding that Commodore took action and should offer all customers free ROM replacements. Unfortunately, Commodore chose to bury their heads in the sand and it was left for third parties to solve this problem, who soon came up with Kickstart ROM switching boards that could allow the Amiga 500 to be downgraded to Kickstart 1.2 or 1.3 when needed. However, some would also argue that this change forced game developers to use better programming habits, which was extra important when you consider that Commodore had already announced the introduction of the next generation Amiga 1000 computer. A program called Relo Kick was also released and even given away as a cover disc with an issue of CU Amiga, which loaded a Kickstart 1.3 ROM image into memory and then booted the machine into Kickstart 1.3, allowing incompatible software to run. In some cases, updated compatible versions of games were later released, such as budget versions of Lotus, Swiv, and Double Dragon 2. After the bad move that proved to be the Amiga 500 Plus, Commodore moved quickly to replace it, and the Amiga 600 was the answer. Released in March 1992, just months after the debut of the A500 Plus, the A600 was created to mimic the design of the new 32-bit Amiga 1200, albeit in a much smaller form. In fact, the size of the new computer was by far the biggest talking point, as it removed the numeric keypad from the right-hand side to make it much shorter. It was clear to most that this was very much designed with games in mind. However, it did have some cool new features to compensate, including the ability to add an internal hard drive and PCM CIA port. It also shipped with Amiga OS 2.0, which was considered more user friendly than earlier versions of the operating system. Like the A500 before it, the A600 was aimed at the lower end of the market, and Commodore hoped it would revitalise sales in this sector which had been declining in favour of 16-bit games consoles like the Sega Mega Drive and Super Nintendo. According to Commodore's Dave Haney, the A600 was supposed to be $50 cheaper than the A500, but it came in about that much more expensive. He also revealed that the A600 was originally to have been numbered the A300, positioning it as a lower-end budget model of the Amiga 500+. The higher than expected price of the Amiga 600 meant that it proved a lot less popular than Commodore expected, and they continued to lose ground to consoles in this sector of the market. With Commodore now pinning all their hopes on the new 32-bit A1200 and Amiga CD32 games console, but that's a story I've already covered in an amazing facts video of its own, which I'll link down in the description. The most popular expansion for the Amiga 500 was the Amiga 501 circuit board, which can be installed underneath the computer behind the plastic cover that is commonly known as the trapdoor. This expansion contains an extra 512k of RAM configured by default as slow RAM or trapdoor RAM, and a battery backed real time clock too. The trapdoor RAM and 512k of standard memory within the Amiga now results in a new total of 1MB 
Later on in the Amiga's life, a lot of the software started to require a minimum of 1 meg to run, so this add-on became even more essential for those using an A500. While that expansion memory is connected to the chip bus, hardware limitations of early stock Agnes chip provisions prevent its use as chip RAM, only the CPU can access it. Suffering from the same contention limitations as chip RAM, that memory is known as slow RAM or pseudo fast RAM. Agnes revisions shipped with the late A500 that contained the enhanced chipset do allow use of trapdoor RAM as real chip RAM for a total of 1 megabyte of faster RAM. Additionally, several third party expansions exist with up to 2 megabytes of RAM on the trapdoor board. Using a Gary adapter, that memory will be mapped as either split on chip RAM and slow RAM or fully as slow RAM, depending on your configuration. The Amiga 500 is by far the best selling model in the Amiga family of computers. In fact, it's been said that the A500 was responsible for about 75% of all Amiga sales. Pretty staggering, really. And speaking of sales, of the 5 million units sold in total, I should point out that some figures put it as high as 7 million, but the previous figure was declared by Commodore UK, 85% of all Amiga sold were purchased in Europe, which just shows how important the region was to Commodore. In fact, when Commodore International declared bankruptcy in April 1994, the European parts of the company in the UK and Germany remained profitable, and did their best to take full control of the company, but ultimately failed sadly. The A500 won numerous awards too, including winning the prestigious Home Computer of the Year award in German computer magazine CHIP on three consecutive occasions, and at the European Computer Trade Show in 1991, it also won their own even more noteworthy Home Computer of the Year title. In fact, in my own recent poll, where I asked you all to vote for the greatest home computers of all time, the Amiga was only beaten by its predecessor at Commodore, the C64, and its true ancestor, the Atari 8-bit, finishing in a very credible third place. After much speculation and delays due to the Covid pandemic, in April 2022, Retro Games Limited, who had previously released the C64 Mini, finally announced the release of the A500 Mini. Like their previous Mini, it had no official licensing in terms of the Commodore name, but did through its design, OS and game selection, with RGL having purchased the rights to the Amiga 500 case, design and logo. It was designed to be able to emulate both the original 16-bit OCS and 32-bit AGA hardware, and featured 25 built-in games, including classics like Alien Breed, Another World, California Games, Kickoff 2 and Stunt Car Racer. Though more games could easily be added to the device for anyone wishing to do so. Costing just shy of £120, it was certainly a cheap way to get into the Amiga, with all the advantages of modern technology like HDMI output and support for USB-based controllers. Although the purist would argue that it didn't represent the true Amiga experience, as it was only designed to play games and little else. Some would also argue going down the Raspberry Pi route was a much cheaper and more versatile option if you wanted to explore the emulation side of things. If you imagined having a home computer would be mm. glum, you'll be glad to see the Commodore Amiga 500, which does arcade quality games. You can compose a symphony. Or you can plan a new garden. The Amiga 500 could make all the difference to a child's education. So don't imagine having a home computer would be <coughs> glum, because happily you can buy a Commodore Amiga 500. For details, call 01873-9800. You'll be glad you did. And that rounds up my look at 10 amazing Commodore Amiga A500 facts. Which one of these fabulous facts was your favourite, or can you think of any other tantalising tidbits or trivia that I didn't include? We always love to hear the thoughts and views of my audience, so please get typing in that comment section. Before I go though, I must thank all of my loyal patrons who continue to support my channel and make videos like this possible. I ask you a special thanks for following patrons and YouTube backers in particular for the much appreciated pledges. Grady Haynes, Mitchell Valentino, Seth A. Robinson, Carl Olsen, Dos Gamer Man, Sonic Mania 999, Paul Daniel, Andrew McKay, Retro Resolution, Matt Standish, James Taylor, Trogdor the Burninator, Mins, 8 Bit Guy, Luke MC, 
Ben P. Stein, Toby Kitsune and Electron Star Collapse. If you also want to help support all my creative endeavours including this YouTube channel then please go and check out my Patreon right now. You can get access to future content including downloads, exclusive videos, creative insights and much more besides. I've been the Laird, I thank you for watching and I'll see you all again for another video very soon.